scabby bird? I'm not making a scab. Do you think I'm gonna forge a scabbard? With all this junk? He's my, I'm tool making. He said, I'm not making a scabby bird. This is a hambies. I'm gonna make a hammer for chasing and repousse and for raising so that I can raise the 3D form that I want for the scabbard shape, the little squid head. I'm making a raising stake for the same reason. That'll go into a vise. And then I'll use the raising hammer to raise the shape out I want. I'm making a dishing form for the simple reason that we don't have a dishing form yet. And we should have a dishing form. And then I'm gonna make a soft 1045 iron hammer so that newbies don't destroy anvils while I'm here. I'm not probably gonna finish this tonight, but I can draw this out to the right and appropriate hammer shape and then finish it on another day. The dishing form is gonna be crazy easy. However, are slightly less wrong. Get out. Go to sleep. Hammer time. Yeah. I need a bunch of tools in order to get all the stuff I need to get done done and at speed. And some of them are just the dishing stake is just because I'm about to get into a lot of sheet metal forming for the scabbard and we don't have a dishing shape. I'm hoping the dishing stake may take one heat and one heat only because the just simplest action possible. I'm taking one of these round blanks. I'm going to get it yellow hot. I'm going to run over put it in the hydro press. I'm going to take this hammer, put it on top and hydro press it in and that'll give me a dishing stake in one shot. I'm going to take that guy. I'm going to upset I have the, it's good to have one of each. I have the other repousse, raising, whatever you want to call it. I think it's technically a raising and chasing hammer. This is my blank for it, the same ones in there. I'm going to start by trying to upset it a little bit by calling it very mean names um, to get more mass here in the center of the piece so that when I'm ready to drift my hammer eye, I have more material there. If I started with a piece this thickness and I started drifting through, I'd end up really, really thin here. And then that thin spot will give me an unstable hammer in the socket. I'll put it on the handle and it'll, my first one was very, very thin in the middle and I made it and it works, but the hammer walks itself back and forth because it doesn't have any thickness there. I'm gonna push that little brick further in. Who put this magnet in? Probably get some longer tongues. But so because we have the first piece to compare to, you can see it's gotten a lot shorter already. Can't go too fast with it because steel wants to buckle and curl. We're trying to prevent that from happening. I'm going to do a slit and a drift technique on it. it. Involves cutting yourself a straight channel through the piece of steel first and then widening it with a round drift. Probably do cherry red on the dish and steak. But not tonight. I refuse to use cherry red when anyone else is around. It's pretty poisonous. It's pretty big poison. I love D2. Now to deformation, not anything on the edge. Very, very hot with that open like that.
more heats than I had originally intended, but I've never done this specifically before, so you live and you learn. Our hydro press is not the strongest thing in the world. So as well as upsetting my hammer blank, I oriented it so that it was thickest vertically before I started cutting through. Because the same idea, I want a really, really thick, wide hammer eye, they call it. But a rep, uh, chasing or in racing hammer generally has really, really long arms before the face so that you can get into bowls and into cups and into deep shapes in order to hit the right angle with it. So I want to make sure that I have enough material around the eye and then I'll pinch everything else out and run it away before I make little faces on it. But again, this is a test piece. May not come out great. Whatever. I ain't too chuffed about it. Easy peasy. I finally managed to overheat one of my D2 chisels. <laughs> yeah. We're about 90% of the way through the cut though. There's really not much left. Um, the interesting thing about working with D2 for these things is that it's an air hardening steel. So it got up to a red heat inside the hammer, pulled it out, it is now quenched and hardened. Fairly ridiculous steel. Very, very hot still. So the deforming for these things is so much different than the normal. You go down to Lowe's or Home Depot and you buy a, a chisel. A chisel or a drift or anything. And your normal reaction when you're using these things on this hot steel is they either bend or they just crack and shatter. And these things, damage to the thing is, oh, it's a little softer and rounder on the tip than it was beforehand. So. <laughs> okay. Come on, baby. Don't make me go back to the vice. Don't make me do it. Oh, we're going. So we're so close. You can see that little ripple in the base of the steel, hopefully. Can you see that on camera? That's us getting ready to punch through. This next time, because I have that shape, I'll just go from the other side, line it up with that. And that'll make it a lot easier. Now I need to make my dishing stick one more time. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. So now from here, but yeah, you got a nice deep bowl shape to use for dish forming. And I've got this rim around it, but I'll just take that down so that the bowl is the only really accessible part. So that because if you're trying to make a bowl and you have these hard corners, you can make marks around the steel or stop you from bowling yourself efficiently. Part of me says to go deeper and try to walk my hammer around towards the edges in order to make the, the dish deeper. Stop while you're ahead. <laughs> if I do anything more, I can, if I, if I try to w start walking out, I can make really weird indents and stuff like that. So I think 
think I'll probably leave it. Sam has some um, cannonballs. And a cannonball would be perfect for doing that. But I may need to go over to Josh's shop and get a stronger hydro press. Because Josh has a big old monstrous one. Look out! Everybody died. Come on. Two tongs. Drag to the edge. Grab. Flip. I'm not doing great today getting this thing off. <laughs> Alrighty, hammer's almost done. Not, not done, the hammer eye is almost done. All it needs is a drift to pull it out to the right dimensions. Which I might do by hand, if I can find my drift. You don't want your hammer eye to be round, obviously. Um, Makes it harder to orient on the handle if it's round. If it's perfect circle when you put it on the piece of wood, you can spin because there's nothing stopping it, so you always want to go ovular. You always want to ovulate your hammer eyes. Now you have human vision? Yes! <laughs> I have the average eyesight power of a single human with these on. Yahoo! I'll start with a slightly smaller drift than the one I'm going to end up with just to get sort of keyed into the space I need to be. Should be good. This is an old Joshy Boy original piece, but uh, he left a lot of his hammer marks in, which normally I'm fine with on most tools. You see how my hammer marks are shit? I don't care. Drifts and things meant to go full clean through pieces of steel probably should be as smooth as you can get them so they don't catch and cause friction or interactions with the steel that are going to make the piece either get caught in there and on there permanently or whatever. Same thing with drifts. It swells out here and it actually shrinks here and that's fine as long as you don't have a swell sort of in the middle that returns to a thickness because the piece can get permanently so they call it cold welding. If it, if it gets onto that and shuts on it, you're not getting that out. Generally, if you even if you heat the piece back up that you're working on, this is gonna heat up at the same rate. Any impact's just gonna cause this thing to bend and you lose tools like crazy. So try not to do that. This is not my ship here. So I went from round to a nice little soft square boy. So I'm just, this is about where I'm going to end up on shaping of this one. Before I might draw it out a little bit longer, before I put my, my eye hole in. Um, but I'm just making a soft faced hammer. This is 1045 steel in a large bar. So um, when I make this hammer, even when I quench it, which I will to give it a little bit of a harder face, it won't take on a hardness like say this guy which is 4150 or one of these guys which are high carbon steel and that means that I can leave those around especially for the people taking classes for the first time so that they can have a soft face hammer so they won't ding and destroy our anvils with the hard hammers at first also to be used 
like this hammer as a tool working hammer. So you can see the absolutely crushed up face of this thing is intentional so that, well not so that, but because I use it to strike chisels and such in order to get work done, this chisel is still hot. These chisels especially, all the high carbon ones that I make from here on out, these are, um, ooh, ooh, this is D2, as I've said a thousand times because I'm in love with the metal for hot cut chisels. It's very, very fragile, it's brittle. No matter what you do, almost no matter how you temper it, it doesn't want to get soft in any way, shape, or form. So, was it? hey! So when you hit it with a hard-faced hammer, chips and cracks and things pop off and you lose, you're just breaking the thing. But as long as you're using a soft hammer, no damage will ever happen to the back. Eh, not none, but much less. General rule of thumb. See the same thing with old tools. This is a much older breaker bar, I think, that Josh cut in half and forged and they're just, it's all mushroomed and cracked and destroyed up here. So if you use a soft hammer, you lose a little bit of your force as you're swinging, but Whatever. You make up for it and not having to rework tools every two weeks. Wait. <sighs> nice. It's going to make a good little hammer, I think. It's not going to be quite as raising as I had hoped it would be. So I may have to weld on a, a new face to each of the hammer faces in order to make it quite, well not quite, but to make it as long as I had hoped. One of the first things I always do with these projects when they're new is I fuck them up. I make a project. It's not gonna be a fuck up, it's not gonna be a completely bad thing, it's just not quite the right hit racing hammer I wanted. I just warm myself up. I get myself practiced in making that exact thing that I want. The only real thing I did was just cut too short of a piece of W2. It was fine. And this one will be my base raising hammer for less deep dish pizzas. So I got a nice little hammer eye, all shaped up and ready for me. And I'll, I'll go, a little, I'll go a little more, I'll go a little more. I think it could use just a little bit more. Yeah. I'm gonna grab that hammer blank piece and roast that one up and uh, smush it. Hammer blank. Nice little QB. Uh, oh, I'm gonna leave this one out. This one's gonna sit out for a little while and cool, and then I'm going to mark it and do my eye drifting and slitting, just like I did with the other one. This one I'm going to be a little bit more careful with my lineup because with the bigger piece, if my chisel isn't dead center, actually we have a clip of Peter Johnson talking about this, this is something that's very, very common. If you're trying to slit a hole through a piece of steel and like this, if your hole is even a little bit off center, you're suddenly pushing your chisel against this really, really thick mass as compared to the slightly thinner mass over here, which means the chisel will drift that way and buckle this end out. 
So you want to make sure your lineup is really, really steady and your chisel is going straight vertically in because any change will start to force your hole off center or just drift the whole thing off offline from what you want. So Yeah, a little raising hammer. Sweet. Mind if I grab some heat? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, unless media manager has an issue with it. If media manager has an issue with it, then you're out. it out one direction and down ah. to make a tall or do I want to push in to bait to bait it I'm gonna do one side of this see what happens I've never done a hammer like this normally when I do a hammer I, I love doing these little groovies because I think in some aspects it's to get more hammer face and more distance with less material I'm not using this space is empty which means the hammer doesn't weigh an extra half pound so it's great, but on this, because it's a raising hammer, I think I'm just gonna use the one-sided die to push these up flat with the top, and then I'll draw them out into nice little hammer wings. For the first time ever. For the first time ever. The sidewards tongs. Both sides to do this. Ah, so. Uh, yeah. Shoop. The beginnings. So I'm gonna work these arms out a little longer. I'll keep these mostly the way they are. I'll tighten them up a little bit. But this one's gonna be a little sharper on this. This undercut won't be here almost at all. And this one will have a little bit remaining of the undercut after I'm done pushing. Steak is the raising steak is not a complicated shape. Um, it's just that there's so many different styles. It's basically just a form of shoop, metal bent at a 90 degree angle usually for you to put in a vise, and then use that piece that's extended out for you to raise around. Um, so I'm just gonna basically make a blank for that, and then I'll go online and look at them and figure out which one I actually need for the moment. Kusumi? Not maybe the right songs for this, but whatever. Classic John, wearing my protective ear protection on the sides of my head instead of over my ears. Now we're getting somewhere. Put that back in the boat. One side's gonna be a little bigger than the other because I didn't measure my lineup perfectly, as I will be doing with this one to make sure that doesn't happen. Again, not too worried about it. First raising hammer made. I try not to take too much offense to my own damn self.
knew that was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, job it there. Scrip a darba. Get it out of here! Right, <laughs> I, I, the only thing I'm worried about is you setting a bad precedent for the others. If everyone starts thinking, oh, I can just leave this one thing here, that's not too bad, and then everyone doesn't, and we leave a million things around. The who? Your child? That's annoying. Didn't even birth. <sighs> Raising steak complete for now. Until I figure out exactly which one I want to make. Alright, bud. Take it easy. <laughs> one more heat on that side. And then I think I'm calling it done. Oh no, I gotta drift that one end open again. The middle, because I was hydro pressing the arms so hard, the middle did collapse a little bit in towards its own hole. Sometimes not bad in the way that it did it. When you're making your hammer eye, same thing as with, we don't want to do a perfect round. With a perfect round, the hammer can spin on the handle. So you want to do an oval. And when you do your hole, you don't actually want your hole to be a straight tube because a straight tube means it can slide its way up off the handle. That's good. But if you do a, a double tapered hole so that there's actually a swelling in the middle of the hole, when you do your wedge from the top, it can't slide down the handle and it can't slide off the handle. Well, good stuff. Oh no. Yeah. Shablam. Shaklacky. That's good. <laughs> hmm. Now has bueno. So there we go. Whatever that was. Hour and a half. So some of this is just real simple. It's not gonna be finished for a little while. This is my just a big old chunk made from a piece of round stock, same as this piece here. Just gonna use this as a hammer blank for a soft um, 1045 hammer. This is a nice little raising hammer, piece of, can you see that with the tongs? What if I do, yeah, yeah. What if I do that? Ooh. So, a little raising hammer. Just these really long arms are meant to get in um, to, to deep dish deep dish pieces. They're used to get into uh, deeper forms while you're making bowls and rounds and dishes and cups and things like that. So just some arms on there. Very nice. W2 steel or fancy, fancy, fancy. It'll be super hard, probably too hard, but whatever. I'll soften it up. And then a raising steak. This has been used in conjunction with the hammer. So when this is in a vise, I hold my sheet metal up here and this shape has to change and get ground down to what I need. But once I hold my sheet metal up against this, I'll hammer from this side and I'll bend the piece around that raising stake. 
And the final is this big old ass. Is he still hot? No, oh, finally cooled down. Just a rounding dishing tray, I guess. That's what you call it. Dishing form. Dishing. Steak. I'm going to eventually put a piece of square stock on the bottom so that it'll sit right in the hardy hole and be nice and, yeah, good. I'm going to put some magnets in the bottom and stuff so that it's a pretty cool little guy. So there you go. Work for the day. Nothing too crazy, nothing too complex, just getting forms and shapes ready for the next steps. Yeah. Confetti!